All right, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Balancing Cost, Performance, and Reliability When Choosing Solenoid Valves, brought to you by Peter Paul Electronics Company and Design World Magazine. My name is Paul Heaney, and I'm the Editorial Director for Design World, as well as the Site Editor for Mobile Hydraulic Tips and Pneumatic Tips, which are some great online resources that I hope you all are familiar with. Before we start, a few housekeeping tips here. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag DWWebinar, all one word, and we will have a Q&A session after the presentations. So please go ahead and submit your questions as you think of them, and we will ask as many of them as we can after our presenter is finished. Now the questions can be asked using the GoToWebinar dialog box right there on your screen. A little background on me. I have a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Tech. I've been covering the engineering and manufacturing world for more than 15 years, uh, and I am pleased to be your moderator today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our presenter for being here and to introduce him. Richard Ronzello started as a regional sales manager for Peter Paul in 1991, and he was promoted to sales manager in 1997. A few years later, Richard was tasked with designing all of Peter Paul's brochures and publication advertisements. Today, he's technical support manager overseeing the website, valve applications, and customer concerns pertaining to valves, as well as all facets of technical training for the company's in-house staff and their distributors. And now, without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Richard. Richard? Good afternoon, everyone. Today we'll be talking about balancing cost, performance, reliability when choosing solenoid valves. The webinar overview. We will review key attributes of a valve, demonstrate how to sort out differences, how to select the best product for an application and or industry. Topics range from performance issues like maximum operating pressure differentials to manufacturing techniques, Kanban, passivation, as well as testing and certification. What makes one solenoid valve operate efficiently for the life of an application, while others require more power and suffer premature failure? Key attributes of a valve. Key, attrib uh, key attributes of a valve. Autonomy of a valve, anatomy of a valve, mechanical characteristics, electrical characteristics, operating conditions, valve temperature range, maximum operating pressure differentials, and valve functionality. Anatomy of a valve. This cutaway shows some components that make up a solenoid valve. You have body options or bodies, coils, ports, housings, there's plungers, coil voltages ranging from 2 to 10,000 volts, and different seal materials. The valve body. The valve body houses the inlet, it houses, it houses orifice and inlet and outlet media ports, contains Two drill hole mounting, typically made of stainless steel. Brass, aluminum, and plastic are also available. Other bodies would include manual override, metering, stud mount, and manifold mount to better fit unique applications. Flange seal. The flange seals are the O-rings used to seal between the sleeve assembly and the body. The flame seals allows for no external leakage. The sleeve assembly attaches to the body and houses the plunger, allowing the plunger to travel. Sleeve assembly is, compromised, or is comprised of a non-magnetic tube 
a magnetic metal flange and magnetic metal end stop. These pieces welded together make up the sleeve assembly. A plunger. A plunger travels up and down to seal the orifice, either starting or stopping the flow of the media. The plunger is inserted in the cavity and the end of the plunger. A plunger seal is inserted in the cavity in the end of a plunger. The plunger seal insert material comes in contact with the orifice to seal it. If you notice in the cutaway drawing, this three-way valve has two light blue Buna seals inserted in the plunger to seal the top and bottom of the orifice. Plunger return spring. A valve spring attached to the plunger returns the plunger to its original position when the solenoid is switched off. Coil. Electric current passes uh, through a wire wound around a bobbin to create electromagnet field which draws the plunger upward. Some industry standards includes, include non-molded, molded, molded high-temperature, diode-rectified, and potted and coil housings. The housing. The housing is used to carry the magnetic flux around outside the coil, allowing for an efficient electromagnet. Depending on the application, typical, typical housings would include single or double automotive, explosion-proof, special plating or stainless steel for corrosion environments, and even painted or chrome for aesthetics. Here are some different housing options that might be available. The top nut screws onto the sleeve assembly to, to secure housing and body together, also assist in carrying magnetic flux. Mechanical characteristics. The orifice, used to control flow. Orifice size is directly proportional to the amount of flow. As you increase the diameter of the orifice, you increase the amount of flow. As you increase the orifice size, you decrease the pressure rating. Ports. Threaded holes that allow connection of pipes or other components to the valve. Ports can vary in size and thread type. Port configurations range anywhere from 1032 to 1 8 MPT to 3, H, uh, 3 inch MPT. BSP, metric, SAE, O-ring, British pipe ports, and others are available. Electrical characteristics. Power requirements. Coil voltage. Peter Paul manufactures its own coils, which range in voltages from 2 to 1,040 volts AC, 50 or 60 hertz, 1.8 to 300 volts DC. Coil wattage. Peter Paul designs coils for optimum pulling force ranging from 0.5 watts to 18 watts. Our maximum coil heat rise on standard valves is 85 degrees C. Typical response time on air. Direct acting valves inherently shift very quickly, so the response time indicates plunger, plunger travel of one complete cycle, open to close. It takes 4 to 16 milliseconds to open and 4 to 16 milliseconds to close. With such quick shift time, solenoids can be used to control schemes that require quick responses. Operating conditions. The media, air, water, and other fluids compatible with standard Buna seals. Hot water, gasoline, and many oils require special seal materials. Our standard seal material is Buna and color-coded blue for easy identification. Other color-coded seals are Nordell, FKM, neoprene, urethane, and many others to ensure compatibility with different medias. Temperature range. 
our standard valves are zero, which is minus 18 degrees C, to 140 degrees F, which is 40 degrees C ambient. Zero to 18 degrees to 150 degrees F, which is 65 degrees C media. Coils can be designed to tolerate much higher or lower ambient and media temperatures. Seal materials must also coincide with temperatures exceed the above conditions. The total temperature of a Class A coil is 150 C. Class F is 155 degrees C and Class H is 180 degrees C. Consider coil feeders when ambient and media temperatures are extreme. Maximum pressure differentials. The maximum pressure in which pressure between the inlet and outlet ports of a valve can safely operate the sonar valve. Burst pressure, the maximum pressure which can be applied to the valve without rupturing. Stainless steel valves typically have burst pressure ratings of 10,000 PSI. Leakage, internal leakage, the amount of media that passes between the orifice and the plunger seal when tested at pressure. External leakage, leakage between the internal parts of a, of a valve and external parts of a valve. Typically, valves are tested for allowable leakage per UL specifications and are bubble tight at rated pressures. Vacuum. Vacuum at 30 inches of mercury is equal to 15 psi of forward pressure. Higher vacuum levels over 18 inches of mercury may require special seals other than Buna for creating an adequate seal. Certifications and registration. Typical certifications for valves include UL, recognized, CSA listed, recognized, NSF approved, CE approvals, ATEC certifications, and ISO 9000. A quality management system like ISO 9000 ensures a manufacturer of products consistently meet their certifications. Valve functionality. Two way normally open. A valve in which the orifice is opened in a de energized position and flow, and flow exists between the inlet and outlet ports. If we look at the cutaway in the upper right hand corner, you'll notice the media enters the body at the in port and flows through the sleeve assembly and exits out the out port in the de energized mode. In the energized position, the plunger lifts up, uh, lifts and the seal and seals the top of the orifice, shutting the flow between the inlet and outlet pores. Now, looking at the cutaway in the lower right, the coil is now energized, pulling the plunger upward and closing the top orifice, shutting off the flow. The red indicates the media flow. Two-way normally closed. A valve in which the orifice is closed in the de-energized position and no flow exists between the internal and external ports. No electric current for the coil. Look at the cutaway in the upper right corner. You'll notice the media enters the body in the, at the in port and no flow exists to the out port in the de-energized mode. In the energized position, the plunger lifts off the seat, allowing flow between the inlet and outlet ports. Electrical current is to the coil. Now look at the cutaway in the lower right corner. The coil is now energized, pulling the plunger upward, which allows flow through the out port. Three-way valves. A valve that has two orifices and three ports. One orifice is always open when the other is closed and one port is always open to one of the other two ports. Flow is controlled by opening or closing either of the two orifices. Three-way normally open. 
a valve in which the inlet orifice is open and the exhaust orifice is closed in the de-energized position. If we look at the cutaway in the upper right corner, you'll notice the media enters the top adapter at the end port and flows through the sleeve assembly and exits the cylinder port in the body in the de-energized mode. Full flow can exist between the inlet and cylinder ports. In the lower cutaway, when the coil is energized, the plunger is pulling up, closing the in port, and now media flows between the cylinder and the exhaust port. Three-way normally closed. A valve in which the inlet orifice is closed and the exhaust orifice is open in the de-energized mode. The upper view shows no flow exists at the in port in the de-energized mode, but flow does exist between the cylinder and exhaust port. Flow can be configured to exhaust to atmosphere or piped exhaust. Cutaways on the left signify exhaust to atmosphere, air, on the right, piped exhaust, which show threaded adapter for liquid. The lower, the lower view shows flow from inlet from the import to the cylinder in the and the energized mode, shutting off the top exhaust port. Three-way directional control. A valve in which the inlet is open to the normally open port when the coil is de-energized and open to the normally closed port when the coil is energized. A directional control valve is always flowing in one direction or the other. The upper view shows flow exists between the inlet and normally open ports in the de-energized mode. The lower view shows flow exists between in and normally closed port in the energized mode. Three-way multi-purpose valves, a valve in which functions as three-way normally open, as three-way normally closed, as three-way directional control depending on the piping. The valve can have two inlet and one, and one outlet. This is inverse of a directional control which has one inlet and can flow to one of two outlets. Multi-purpose valves are quite versatile, but in some cases tend to sacrifice pressure ratings. The internal springs are modified to accommodate this multifunction. Valve types. General purpose valves, direct acting. General purpose valves range in port sizes between 1032 to a quarter inch NPT ports typically utilized for water and air and other media compatible with Buna seals. Explosion proof. A solenoid valve constructed to meet specifications of UL and CSA for operation in hazardous locations. Locations in which combustible dust fibers or gases may be present to the atmosphere around the valve. These valves are designed to either completely segregate the combustible atmosphere from the electrical coil, the ele uh, encapsulated coil technique, or contain a pot potential explosion inside very substantial housing structures surrounding the coil. That would be the flame-proof technique using machined metal housings, shown in the photograph on the lower right-hand corner. High pressure, typically having maximum pressure ratings between 1,000 and 5,000 PSI. Constructed as impact valves utilizing a pin which functions as a sealing element. The plunger accelerates for a short distance before impacting the pin opening the orifice. High flow valves typically are are pilot operated to allow large main orifices and therefore higher flow rates.
demonstration how to sort out valve differences. Considering all the variables, we have flow, which has liquid, gas, and CV rating, pressure, vacuum, or up to 5,000 PSI, connections, NPT, British pipe thread, etc., valve function, two ways, three ways, etc. The environment, is it hot, cold, extreme, water resistant or hazardous location? The size for packaging, energy, power requirements, and media, liquid, gas, etc., and temperature considerations. How to select the valve, the best product for an application and or industry. Valve specifications. Six questions to get the, day, the best base valve for your application. Question number one, port size. What port size connections are appropriate for your application? Specify a, port, a pipe port size will eliminate any series that does not contain that particular port size. Not only is port size an important, but where ports are located as well as port connections may be easier when installing a valve. Typically, ports like bottom orifice, bottom cavity, 90 degree left or right, make it easier to install when space is limited. Function. How would you like the valve to function? Specifying a function will determine the type of valve. Is it a two-way, a three-way? Is it normally open or normally closed? If the answer is I don't know, you can always refer to the graphic for flow configuration. Flow configuration or flow paths require different valve functions. Functions. This chart helps in that decision. Voltage. What is the actual voltage and frequency the valve needs to function at? Valves are designed to operate at plus or minus 10% of nameplate voltage. For an example, common voltages on AC would be 24 volts 60 hertz, 120 volts 60 hertz, 240 60 hertz, and 230 50 hertz for Europe. Common DC voltages would be 6 volts DC, 12, 24, and 48 volts DC. Maximum operating pressure differential. What is the maximum pressure the valve will see? I.e., is it 25 PSI, 100, 500, etc.? This illustration shows the compressor puts 300 PSI and the valve has 100 PSI back pressure from the tank. So the valve actually sees 200 PSI from the inlet to outlet. The flow rate. What is the required flow? The flow rate and CV questions pertain to flow char characteristics. Flow rate is a function of inlet versus outlet pressure, orifice size, not just the inlet pressure or just the orifice size. CV factor is the quantity of 60 degree Fahrenheit water expressed in gallons per minute, which will flow through the valve at one PSI pressure drop. Orifice size is dedicated, or is, is dictated by either flow rate or CV factor. In North America, typical flow units are CFM, cubic feet per minute for gas, and GPM, gallons per minute for liquid. Electrical connection, the housing. What is required for the electrical connection? 
Here are two most typical housings available for electrical connections. The conduit, coil and close, enclosure that allows a conduit pipe to be attached to the valve, therefore covering exposed lead wire. And grommet, coil enclosure with two exposed lead wires. Some industry standards would also include DIN type, yoke with spade coil, strain relief, automotive and splice box housings. Performance issues. Cycle life. This depends on the application, but tens of millions of cycles on lubricated media is typical for a solenoid valve. One extreme application, a product was developed to reach one billion cycles. Manufacturing techniques. Kanban. Kanban is a lean concept of controlling inventory. The customer experiences short lead times, reduced inventory levels, higher inventory turns synchronize your production more closely with purchased material receipts, increased flexibility as product demands flu fluctuates, improved supplier performance. The supplier experiences level demand and resulting in improved quality and delivery performances to the customer, right size and planned inventories create smoother production flow and increased uh, and improved cash flow. Increased communications, Kanban signals enhances flexibility and enables faster reaction to change in demand. Part finishing or passivation. Passivation method. This proprietary method is applied and to the various stainless steel components of a valve. This ensures a highly corrosive resistant surface condition. The part finish. The orifice geometry and finish helps ensure a bubble tight seal. R&D and testing. Comprehensive valve solutions entail valve design, 3D modeling, application engineering, in-house prototyping and sampling, in-house validation testing. We have thermal hot and cold environment chambers, moisture humidity chambers, vacuum to 5,000 PSI gas, hydraulic oil stand to 3,500 PSI, and vibration tables. Pre-production pilot run 3P process, plastic design molding, magnetic analysis, and electromechanical ma design to produce cost-effective and reliable products. Manu our manufacturing capabilities include machining, boring, broaching, drilling, facing, filing, finishing, grinding, grooving, honing, knurling, and etc. Our molding characteristics or our capabilities are injection molding, insert molding, polymer molding, and pore molding. We have fabrication capabilities, bending, bonding, forming, piercing, shearing, etc. At Peter Paul, 85% of solenoid valves are manufactured in-house. I'd like to thank everybody for participating in this event. And if you have any questions, uh, I think our moderator can take over from here. Thanks again. Hello, am I unmuted? Sorry, everyone, trying to unmute myself here. Thank you, Richard. Yes. All right, uh, we will now use the remaining time for questions. Uh, we have some that have been coming in, but it is not too late. In your question, the dialog box on your GoToWebinar screen there. All right, Richard, you ready? I am ready. All right, uh, first question that came in, what is the typical life of a valve? Uh, I guess the answer is it depends on what media go, is going through the valve. We, we discussed the, there's, the pressure ratings that are anywhere from zero to a 5,000 PSI or perhaps more 
uh, the more stringent the steel material needs to be so it doesn't cut or deform or rip out. Uh, the steel materials as well, we have plastic, glass, aluminum, and stainless steel bodies and sleeves. Mm -hmm. And again, it depends on if the, if the air is lubricated, what the wattage is. Uh, it depends on a lot, but it's, it's typically at 100 PSI valve with uh, lubricated air, we, we achieve 30, 40 million cycles. We take the valves apart here at Peter Paul and look at the seal material. That's the thing that usually wears out the first versus our stainless. And the seal material pretty much has to look brand new and, and be bubble tight at 30, 40 million cycles under those conditions. Anything less than that, if you're running, if you're running a sandy solution through the valve, uh, obviously the wear is going to be a little bit greater. So it's okay. all relative. Uh, we also had someone ask about, are, are there valves that can be submerged? Yeah, typically our coils, um, our non-molded and molded coils, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty porous. Um, they're good for a wetted condition, you know, occasional splashing on car washes. We have NEMA 4 and NEMA 4 X-rated valves that are corrosive resistant and waterproof but not submersible. We do have a submersible valve. This entails a different process. We actually turn the housing upside down. We liquid pour a very dense plastic solution over the coil. Uh, and they're used on uh, trailers for boats that get submerged in uh, 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 salt water applications, and they work absolutely great. So we do have a submersible valve. We do water fountains as well. Oh, wow, okay. What is the typical stroke length that an armature would be subjected to in high pressure and low pressure applications? And uh, would this have an, uh, an impact on response time? You have to say, re repeat that. I, I missed that third or fourth word. Sorry. What is the typical stroke length an armature would be subjected to uh, in a high pressure or a low pressure application? And would it have an impact on response time? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, consider this, if you have a half-inch orifice, there's a rule of thumb, there's a mathematical figure that you perform that says the plunger has to travel so much, usually it's four times the diameter is the multiplication factor, so um, if I have a very small orifice, the stroke is probably anywhere from, you know, 16 to 25 thousandths of an inch, that's the plunger stroke. Uh, and, okay. it, and it goes up from there. So a typical 132nd orifice would have a very short stroke. Uh, the shorter the stroke, the more life you get out of the valve. It doesn't travel as much. Um, and that's typically how it works. Okay. One of our attendees asked if you could give a little more information about the magnetic analysis of valves. Sure. Um, our valves are typically rated at like 9.5 watts DC and 10.5 watts AC. I mean, that's a that's a ballpark figure. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole point of, of saying balancing cost and performance and reliability when choosing a valve, this is exactly what we mean. If a customer comes to us and says, hey, your catalog valve is 100 PSI with a 1 16th orifice, and the customer is looking for 200 PSI, there's a lot of things we can do. We can lighten the, the plunger return spring. Uh, we can give the coil more wattage, uh, giving it more pulling force. Um, and, and the same strategy goes for uh, a low watt valve. If the customer is using the valve at a lot lower pressure than our catalog is, we can actually su supply a coil voltage that, say, is a, a 48 volt coil DC and hit it with 12 volts. It'll probably take one and a half watts to open versus our 9.5 watt valve. So you get cooler operation, longer life, and uh, a lower wattage if you need it. Okay. Next question, what are some standard tests carried out for certifying valves before you put them into service? Uh, every one of our valves at Peter Paul go through UL testing. Uh, there's a, UL puts out a, a, a list of tests that we have to perform. And we at Peter Paul don't, don't segregate UL valves from non-UL valves. We test every valve in the same manner before at least Peter Paul. There's internal and external leak checks, submergible tests that we do. There's coil high pot tests. There's resistance tests. There's uh, at rated pressure, it has to work at 85% of rated voltage. Those are the tests that we do before they leave Peter Paul. So the interesting thing about being in sales for 23 years is when Peter Paul delivers a valve, we know it's going to work at the customer's end. Great. 
Uh, I had a couple questions about uh, mounting. Can can a valve be mounted in any position? Uh, typically, uh, yes, but there are a couple of valves. Some of our high-pressure impact valves, as I stated pr uh, previously in the slide, the plunger is freewheeling, and what happens is on these high-pressure applications, I energize the coil, the coil starts lifting up the plunger, the plunger travels at a high rate of speed, halfway up the travel cycle, it grabs that Kellef pin and it yanks it out of the orifice. That's how we achieve these high pressure valves. So in those, in those cases, our high pressure valves can only be mounted 20% or 20 degrees of, uh, of vertical. Every other valve, the plunger return spring is enough where you can turn the valve upside down or any position. Oh, great. Okay. Richard, what is the, uh, for a proportional valve, what's the typical frequency for dither to avoid stiction? Well, uh, at Peter Paul, we don't make proportional valves. They're direct acting valves. The only way we can get a, uh, our valves to act like a proportional valve, because our valves can cycle up to 10 times a second, uh, mm -hmm. if you can pulse and modulate the valve with your controller, you can actually flow anywhere from... Uh, you know, if the valve is rated at 10 gallons an, um, a minute, you can actually flow from 0 to 10 gallons a minute, depending how, how uh, you control the on and off cycle of the valve. So we don't sell proportional valves, but we can certainly sell you a direct acting valve with the right controller, and it acts like a proportional valve. Gotcha. All right, one last question here. What, how do I know what seal material is compatible with my media? Well, with Peter Paul, you called me, I guess. <laughs> no, our customer service, our customer service group is extremely efficient. We have a good engineering staff. We have uh, compatibility books, whether it's uh, for metals and uh, elastomers. And uh, you know, the whole secret about performance and reliability and the balancing cost when choosing a valve is all about telling us what the media is and what the pressure is and what temperatures that the valve is going to work at. Because when we spec in the valve, this is a make-or-break situation. We at Peter Paul like to give you the, the smallest, most economical valve that will do the job for millions of cycles. If you specify the wrong seal material, the life is expectancy is going to be a lot shorter. If you specify a, or don't specify a certain temperature and you put it under a high temperature application, it hardens up the seals and, and eventually you burn out the coil. So knowing all these things beforehand when you spec in the valve, exactly the conditions of the application. If you forward that information to us, we'll tell you exactly the right valve for your application. Very good. Well, great Q&A. Now, if anyone, if you have additional questions that come to mind, you are welcome to email those to me at pheaney at wtwhmedia.com, and I will make sure that Richard and his team uh, gets those and get, gets you some answers. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar from Design World and Peter Paul. This presentation will be emailed to everyone in the coming days, and it will also be available at www.designworldonline.com. Thanks once again to Richard for all of his insights. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Goodbye.